hope we had a, a good week. Of, uh, those who went for the camp, we're still thinking, practicing, pondering. Okay, a lot of things were taught. Okay, you need to digest. <laughs> exactly. We need to take the time to think through it. Okay. Uh, go through it again. And uh, go, well, it's a lot there to, to think through. Okay. This is a wonderful blessing, you know. It really is that we don't realize. Uh, so sometimes you look at it, some don't have. This one is have in abundance. It's a question of what we do with it. Okay, I, I, okay, right. So it's you. Know, you don't know what to do with it. I, my lemon tree is fruiting and. Don't, well, the lemons are all over the place. I remember the time, the last time my lemon tree only gave me one lemon. Whole tree, one lemon. And then I applied the old ways, I threatened it. Put an axe next to it. Hint, hint. And then, of course, uh, you know. No, what really happened was I learned, okay, now what do I do? You know, people tell me lemon tree goes grows anywhere, everywhere. You don't need to look after it. And that's exactly what I did. I didn't look after it. Uh, weed was growing all over the place. Nothing came out. And then I began to research it a little bit, look at it. You actually have to take care of it. Put nutrients, water it, and all that. Clear the ground, fertilize, all that stuff. And the fruits you know, really came. Okay, it really came. And it's interesting, that tree, every, every season, it will always have a twin. Have you ever seen a lemon that is a twin? Twin lemons? Two in one lemon? Literally. That's interesting. Really, now we look at it and it's just thankful. See, same picture of our life, you see. We cannot expect fruitfulness if we don't do anything. We just allow our life to go as it is. Don't water it. Don't feed it. Ha, there's this thing called power feed. And camp is a time where we power feed like crazy. Wow, power feed. Right? So camps are wonderful things. And then you've got to consistently look after it. And the word is consistent. Once in a while, we feed on God's word. Right? And then, okay. Next time we really study the Lord's Word is next year family camp. We are going to look at trouble. Okay, so I want to encourage us all to, where the camp left off, carry on, continue. If there is a special awakening, say, you know, I, I really need to know the Lord's Word far better. Then let it be a challenge. I've got to really take the time to uh, learn, grow, understand. Now, my life not in order. Well, order it. Remember the story of Hezekiah. Right? He asked God for 10 years of life. And God gave it to him. What did you do with that life? He wasted it. He didn't order his household. And because of that, his son, who became king, literally brought the ruin of the nation. Why couldn't he just take the time to do that? Well, that has become, all these become biblical examples. Problems can arise. And we don't deal with the problems. The blessings of God can literally be squandered. Okay, well, let's take time to read the Lord's Word. We're going to continue in our study of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to take a look at how Problems can come and how we must address them. And in the non-addressing, there will, we would, we're going to see a lot of trouble that could hurt the church. Okay, well, let's pray together for a while. Our Father, we pray this morning that as we are now over one week after our family camp, 
Lord, let not this zeal, that special revival that we experience in camp die. Let us learn how to continue to fan, continue to nurture, continue to be challenged to read your word. Lord, help us and grant us that wisdom, that understanding we need, that we may sustain this spiritual life. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's, take a, let's turn to 1 Corinthians. Okay. Now, when we talk about seeking God's blessings sometimes, you know, we wonder whether God has blessed. What if the blessings are actually already there? Right? The blessings can already be there. It's like a well. Okay, you see, a, a, the water, right, in those days is a hole, really. The water is actually already there. It's a question of, one, digging. Two, removal of all the things to get to it. Right? What if the Lord's blessings is already there? And there are lots of things that are hindering, that we don't realize, and we can't tap into it. If we study Corinthians very, very carefully, this is the case. All the sin problems hinder. All the infighting hinder. The blessings of the Lord were already there. See, we, when we don't understand this, we are asking, Lord, bless, 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 because we don't see it. We're almost praying the wrong prayers where we need to ask wisdom, discernment to see what is hindering. Right? Because you ask bless, or actually already bless. Okay, let's take a look at this, because Paul is helping the Corinthian church to see the grace of God has already been given, as in given. Now, this is chapter 1, Verse 4, he says, I thank my God always concerning right, you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Who brought about this blessing? Christ. It is the Lord Jesus Christ that brings about that blessing into life, into the church. God promises to bless. And we're going to read about the promises of God's blessing later on in Genesis 12. But who brings it into reality? Christ. This is why we, we, we need faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Right? And so Paul says, by Christ. What happens? You were enriched. See the word enriched? This is all talking about that which is already given. Not future given. Enriched in everything. Again, by Him in all utterance, all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. That is a wonderful blessings of the Lord, to be able to have knowledge, to have understanding, to have articulation. That is really wonderful blessings. I don't know whether you realize knowledge 
from God is a blessing. I do. I really do. Because every single day when you receive emails asking, how do I understand this text? How do I understand the Lord? And able to, that in itself is a blessing. Not just for your life, but for others. That's why the imagery of a wells of salvation. You don't dig around just for yourself. The whole community benefits. But when you don't have that knowledge, it is literally, here's the water, here you are, everybody dies. That's a sobering, sobering thing. Okay? You can have all the physical blessings. You can have all the other things. No knowledge. And so Paul takes it up. Sure, you can be enriched. Now, here's another balance. Knowledge. Okay? And so we read all knowledge. They were short of no gift. Right? And then we read. This is a reason that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that is the challenge. That is the real challenge. These things are provided. What is required of you? There is requirement. When the Lord bless, there is a requirement. What is God's requirement of His people, of His church? You be blameless until the Lord returns. This is why in Psalm 119, the psalmist begin to realize he was not blameless. Right? He has not kept the Lord's word. He has forgotten the Lord's word. His life was not in order. Hence, the Lord's blessings were not tapped into. It's there. It's there for you. What's missing? What is required? That is something we have to think about, right? So that you will be blameless. Now, this is important. Okay? God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of His Son. Will God do it? God is faithful. You don't need to worry. If the requirements are fulfilled, those things will happen because God is faithful. He, remember, He's called you into the fellowship of His Son. Then how come I don't see it in my life? Now, you've got to ask yourself, have I fulfilled the requirements of the Lord? Do I even know what it is? that you may be blameless. And if you want to sum up one thing, Paul sums it up. What is that requirement? Be blameless. That's exactly what God said to Abraham. Walk before me blamelessly. And I will bless you. See, it's promise. But a fact applied Walk before me blameless. We don't realize that. We all, okay, Lord bless me. See, you didn't bless me. Maybe you're not real. That's our problem. We don't really understand. God gives. This is His blessing. This is what is required of you. Right? Now, we got to look at that very, very carefully. Now, we go on further. How come these blessings are not realized or fulfilled. If they're there, what can hinder it? Now, we got a series of problems that Paul had to actually deal with because these things will literally hinder the blessings of God in the church. Right? Now, let's take a look at some of these problems. Number one, division. And so he says, verse 10, 
Let there be no divisions among you. Right? See, this is, becomes a problem. When we look at each other and then we say, okay, this group, this group, we begin to draw lines in the church. It's us and they. This is this group. This is this family. This is that family. When you begin to see the church like this, you are causing the division. You already think division. Right? Oh, we're just there. We just watch how it goes. Oh, this church is run by a few families. You think, you see how carnal and sinful we are? Let there be no division. We don't realize comments like this actually hinder our own spirit. And so he says, let there be no divisions. What is the division? Right? It's amazing how in, in the world of sports, teams, you know, they, they play all over, the, all over the world. You know, when they go and play in the World Cup, <clears throat> they have not been playing together for, what, what I mean, four years because they all go, they're good players all over the world. They are playing Brazil, play the top clubs. And then they all put together, okay, go now play as a team. That is hard. The moment you think you are better than the other person, you can be a top player. Your team will never win. You're only thinking, I've got to take it, I've got to, why should I buy? What makes a team really outstanding? Even though they're not all great players. <laughs> trust. They trust each other. They really have learned to trust each other. Right? Now, here's another idea. It's just almost finishing this book from the ground up by Howard Schutz. On, on, you know, really, he wrote this talking about how uh, this last part of it, <clears throat> he went to China, which all his shareholders say, why do you want to bring coffee into China? Chinese people are tea, tea, no, tea, tea drinking people. They are not going to accept coffee, especially given in a paper cup. This will be insult to Idri. So no, he saw something that others didn't. You know the population of China? A billion, that's a big market there. You know. The rising of middle-income people, we're going to go in. Not only potential market, but we're going to not just sell coffee, we are going to, interesting, sell the brand of leadership of Starbucks. Now, that is interesting. First, you've got to be proven. So, you know, in the US, in other parts. Then he went down there. Right? How do you do it? How do you really do it? You know what he does? It is a, it is a very strange thing. He calls for annual meetings with his staff and he meets them. Here is the chairman of Starbucks and he meets with the baristas and their family members like, you know, parents. And so he will meet with them. And they, first, the, the parent says, is this a scam? Because which, in the Chinese mind, the top boss is never going to meet with the workers. This is the top guy. No top guy is going to meet with the workers, so they think it's a scam. And it wasn't a scam. He genuinely cared. He didn't always succeed. Why? He controlled. He says, Starbucks cannot control from the US. We've got to learn one important word, word if we're going to make it work. Trust. And so he did something that he didn't do with the others. They gave them full support, found a 
good CEO there that shared the same values, that said this is what they want to do, and say, you know what, we're going to trust you. Go ahead, develop it. He was right. From one store to two store to three store to over a few hundred store. Today, every 15 hours, Starbucks opened a new store in China. 15 hours. And they said it wouldn't work. So what is the model? Very simple. If we dare to do this, trust. You've got to learn to trust them. You've got to learn to build that trust. You've got to be trustworthy. You're really there. You really care for the people. He started something that was really very different. It's called filial piety. He says, when I was growing up, when my father was dying of cancer, we had a financial burden. And that was really, really painful. And I want to do something that other people did not, does not have to go through what we have to go through. We're going to support them. We're going to help them. See, this is what a community spirit should be. You begin to realize, where does he get all these things? And then you, know, you read in between the lines. He's actually got a group of... He's actually got a rabbi that teaches... This is all biblical. The principles that he is applying is actually biblical. That's why it succeeds anywhere. Any, even in the secular world, yes. The principles are from God. Can we, can we do this? Right? And so he tells the church, let there be no... See, when you see the vision, there is a lack of trust. That's how division occur. We don't trust each other. This department don't trust the other department. Right? There is a lot of mistrust. In India, government departments sue government departments. They take each other to court. Department of Transport sues Department of Housing. If you have top the, the, the body there that is meant to govern the place, sue each other, don't trust each other, how is it going to work? It's obviously not going to work. You can have a wealth of resource. You can have a lot of, right? You can have a country with a lot of resources, but you have bad management, you've got bad government, you've got division, it's all going to be squandered. Obviously. And so you can have a church, you can be enriched in everything, you can have this, you can have that, and watch what happens if, when division is there. Right? And so Paul says, look at, watch out for this problem. Let there be no divisions. Okay, now, here is another problem. Contention. Okay? And it says, it has been clear to me concerning you, my brethren, those of Chloe's household, that there is contention among you. Now that is a real problem. When we literally fight each other, argue with each other. And then he says, verse 12, I say this, each of you say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Look at this, this is factions, different groups you're going to have this. Okay, so this was a Corinthian problem. Deep down, now there is a deeper issue. There actually is a deeper issue. What was a deeper issue? Okay, why I am of Paul, of Apollos, of Cephas, and some say I am of Christ. There is a group that says, I am, they, they respect Paul, they love Paul, they see his work, they really support his work, and, and so on and so forth. What about the others? Not all do. 
There's a group that accuses Paul, that speaks against Paul. Right now, this became a problem here. Okay? Now, in verse 14, we read, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus, Gaius, and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Let's try and understand. What is, what is this saying here? Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beside, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel now. This is obviously an issue here of baptism. What is he saying? Why is he bringing this up? He says, I did not know whether I baptized any other. He is, he is not, oh, I forgot. Because if you look at the list here, it's not a long list. It really isn't, right? Who was baptized by Paul here? Crispus, Gaius, household of Stephanus, and then he says, I do not know whether I baptized any other. Hi, you mean you cannot rem remember past four groups of people? The problem here is not Paul's forgetfulness. What is the problem that Paul was breaking up? See, when you, in your heart, in your mind, division is inside you. Contention is inside you. You see things very differently in the church. Even on baptism, that which is good, which is sacred, which is holy, can become a problem too. You literally will find fault in everything. Even in baptism. You see Paul baptized? How come he didn't baptize this person? How come he baptized that person? Right? Worse, you say he baptized in his own name, which is absolutely spurious. There are people in the church that do not like Paul. Later on, you're going to see this. They will say Paul likes to boast about himself. They actually said that. And Paul defends it and says, if I want to boast, I boast of my infirmities. He uses the word boast because there were people who will be whispering behind. You see, Paul, see, they will criticize his message. They will pick here and there and turn it around. You see how sinful, how divisive, how carnal. This is in the church. And Paul knows that. He hears it, and he addresses all the accusations that was hurled against him. Why? See, some people just, let's just keep quiet. You know, there will be people. Just, just let it be. God will punish them. Let God deal with them. That could be one approach. Or you address it. One, like in the spirit of Moses, number 16, for their sake that they can recognize these things here. Two, you've got to defend the ministry of the Lord. You cannot allow false allegations spread. You have to address it. And so Paul addressed it. But I like the way he addressed it. It is really... Was he angry? Was he upset when people are speaking against him? In his younger days, you should read Galatians. Right? The, the very different spirit. Paul has grown. And there he's grown. People, we've got to keep growing. The last time, the book of Galatians, you want to turn to Galatians? What happened when people uh, do things and Paul would write to them? Okay. Now, Galatians 
is really sobering. Okay? And so, Galatians 1, and then verse 6, he tells them, after he greets them, right? He reminds them that it is Jesus that gave himself for our sins. And then he says to them, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. And then, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then we have preached to you, let him be a curse. Wow, he pronounced the curse of God on them. You want to hurt the Lord's word, right? You want to hurt the Lord's work? Let you be a curse. <laughs> this is fiery Paul. Not that he has become subdued over the years. He has learned to not allow these things to affect his spirit, to affect his ministry. See, Moses can get very angry too, you know. And when he's angry, he takes the rod and hits the stone. And then he ends up sinning against God. You've got to watch out for your emotions. Servants of God has to watch out for these things. Will people speak against you? They will. They would speak against Christ, they will speak against Paul, they will speak against Moses. It will come. Question is, how do you handle it? Now, I, I like how Paul has truly grown. You go back to 1 Corinthians. To me, this is absolutely incredible. You know what's his approach? In verse 14, he says, I thank God. Huh? How can you still thank God? Yes, I thank God. This is an absolutely wonderful, positive... See, your focus... When, when people attack you, you end up becoming so self-conscious, you almost want to attack back. Paul, he doesn't... This is, we, we will be learning about the presence of God over the pulpit, uh, over the week's pulpit series. He does not lose that sense of presence of God. I thank God. You know why he's thanking God? They were accusing him of baptizing people in his own name. That's how proud he was. I baptize you. You know what? I eh, baptize you in the name of Paul. Of course, which is rubbish. But you know, there are people who talk rubbish anyway. They will spread rubbish. And he is just going to say, look, let you say this. Huh? Let me tell you something. Okay? I only baptize a few families. And he says, I thank God that I baptize none of you. <laughs> he was not caught up in this ministry. This baptism was not his main focus. See, sometimes churches can make one thing the focus and then they split over that. And it has happened. Churches split over how baptism is to be done. Right? Right? And so Ed is right. How much water? Just enough. Because that is not, we can miss the, you want to fight over how much water? And then, you know what? I can't stand it. You don't give me enough water. And then let's, let's split. That is absurd. We have lost the plot when we fight over things like that. Can it happen? It was starting to happen way back in Corinthian church. They were fighting, debating, divided over how baptism is to be carried out. How come Paul do it this way? How come Peter do it this way? How come you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit? How come you know, one baptized only in the name of Jesus Christ? How come he will baptize in his own name? And so they began to be so divided out of lack of understanding. Out of, right? Yeah, you don't like different things. 
that could really be a problem. So what was he saying? He says, look, I thank God. Okay, now, this was not the main focus. Can I still thank God? I'm not going to allow these things to get the better of me. Now, he's not ignoring the problem. Focus, God. Focus, don't lose focus. What is the purpose of your calling? Right? And so we read in verse 17. For Christ, see, first, he, his focus, God. Right? Then, verse 17, Christ's focus. Did not send me to baptize. Not that baptism is not important. Baptism is in the natural outcome of what? The gospel being preached. The gospel being believed in. Right? Genuine faith is seen. You baptize. What is the focus we should be concerned about? The preaching of the gospel. Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That is the focus. We can lose focus after a while if we are not careful. We can be so caught up with problems, we lose the focus. We can be so caught up with contention, with division, we lose the focus of what the church is all about, what our Christian calling is all about. When we come to church this morning, did we come with a great sense of focus? and purpose of our calling? What are we called to do? When I came to faith in Christ, yeah, right? This is 18 years old, 19. One of the things that really troubled me, and I mean trouble, that keep on burdening me, was the question, what did the Lord save me for? What is my purpose? Surely He didn't save me to, just to fill the church. Uh, you know, pew warmer, sit down there and, and just another person that would attend church. Surely He didn't save me for my own happiness. That you're okay now. Okay, now you're a Christian now. Right? On, on the census, you can take religion, Christianity. Surely Christ did not die, suffer and die and did all that for what? What is my purpose? That became a hunger and a search and a quest when I was a teenager. That literally drove me to learn, to understand, to keep on learning whatever opportunity I was given. What did Christ save me for, and send me to do. We are not just saved by grace. We are sent. Have we understood this part? We end up stopping here. Thank God I am saved now that I am baptized. What happens when you become complacent, what happens when you become, we don't understand this, we end up not liking things, debating over things. Right? There is something to be done. Our energy, our focus was not meant to be channeled and how should we do things? Sent. Equipped, be trained, be sanctified, speak better, grow in knowledge that we can be sent. This is Isaiah. God says, whom shall I send? Isaiah's reply, send me. 
Have we understood this part of being sent by the Lord? Where is the focus, the purpose? What is it? See, this is why Isaiah, Old Testament, New Testament are beautifully interwoven together. God sends His messengers and we are talking not just Isaiah, but the entire nation of Israel. Who is my servant, my messenger? And sad to say, God had to say, my servant blind, my messenger deaf. See, the idea of being sent is servanthood. And we have devoted two months to taking a look at this subject. In the next two months, we will be looking at the presence of God. When we lose sight of the presence of God, we forget this part. God sent. Paul never lost sight of it. I thank God. Right? You can say what you want, but you know what? I thank God. I am not going to be caught up in your fights. I'm not going to, I'm going to stand for truth. That is not true. I tell you what God did. And this is what God has called me for, sent me for. You just speak the truth. And you will not need to worry about what other people will speak against you. People will speak. Paul is not going to run away. Wow, you know, they don't like me. You know, they, 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 they speak against me. So you got so many other churches, you see. Let's go to the Philippi church because they all like him. To him, it's not about people alone. Every church is precious. Every church Christ died for. He is going to be there. He is going to defend it. He is going to lead them back to the Lord. How do you do that? Stand for the truth. Go back. Bring people. Look. Where's God? They were so caught up with each other. God is almost out of the picture. Right? When I mean God, I don't mean just utter the name of God. Where's God in your life? Where's Christ in your life? Can you genuinely say, thank God, you know, I can see His hand rather than sit around and complain against church members, against church leaders. You know how sinful that is? You know how it's going to literally hinder the Lord's blessings in your life, in your family? And the more you do it, you do nothing but compound it. That's why Paul had to step it and say, no, this has got to, first, this has got to stop. Stop this. Right? Stop this. Now, two, by example. What, what is he going to do? Look, let's go back. Where is God? Where is the presence of God in your life? Right? Now, Christ. Christ did not send me to... Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words. Now, this doesn't mean uh, just say whatever you want. The wisdom here would be further discussed in chapter 2, chapter 3. There are two kinds of wisdom. There's the wisdom of God and there's the wisdom of the world. And there are you know, the, he is not going to use the wisdom of the world to preach the gospel. What is the wisdom of the world to further God's work? What is the wisdom of the world? Use politics. Let's draw crowd to ourselves. Let's gain advantage. Let's all group together. You know, right? if the bigger our group, the more clout we have. The biggest say we have, that is the wisdom of the world. There's a very secular way of thinking. I'm not going to do that. 
what am I going to do? And he says, you do this, the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Is the preaching of the gospel effective? Actually effective. How will it be effective? Okay, now let's, let's take a look at this. Right? The message of the cross. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. What is the effect it has when we really share with people the gospel? Has it any effect? Okay, let's take a look at Romans. How come, right, Paul can be so effective? Now, we see this. How did Paul preach the gospel? How was he able to, right, his salvation, sent the idea of servanthood? We see it all here. How was he really able to save souls, really be able to be so significant? And there is truly spiritual power in the way he ministers. Not your own power. How come he was really able to have this? Now, we're going to uh, take a look at this. Okay, In uh, Romans chapter 1, Right? Let's read from verse 14. And you've got to see this. It's really about how you see your faith, how you apply your faith, how you really understand this whole idea of who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 1.14. Right? Paul can use the word, I, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Right? What's the other side? The Lord is, He is truly Lord. Now, how does He feel deep down inside as a bondservant? Verse 14 tells us, I am a debtor. Right? You are indebted. A slave is indebted. A servant is indebted to the Greeks, the barbarians, both to the wise, to the unwise. Rather than division, no division, whether you are wise, unwise, barbarian, Greek, whatever, it doesn't matter. Right? To him, he does not see color. He does not see difference. He feels just indebted to different people. How come? He says, as much as it is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. See, the gospel has got to be inside you. It is not a prepared outline. It is not the, what is inside you. If sinfulness is inside us, if carnality is inside us, if worldliness is inside us, and half the time we're complaining, fighting, and all that, what's going to come out? That's what's going to come out. Are people going to benefit from your sharing of the gospel? Absolutely not. What is inside you? Is the gospel message really inside you? Is Christ inside you? Is the living God inside you? Is the Word of God inside you as much as it is inside me, he says. And so when we don't know the Lord's Word, nothing is inside us. Obviously, nothing goes in, nothing comes out. A little bit goes in, a little bit goes out. What is inside us? 
The challenge is to say, as much as it is inside me, I am ready all the time, any time. Why? Because you live it out all the time. It's inside you. There is knowledge, there is wisdom, there is life, experience and understanding from your faith, from the Word of God you just draw from all the time. All the time. Inside you. Okay? And then he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, verse 16, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Now, there is your spiritual power. There is the power. What is this power? The power to salvation to everyone who believes. Right? Now, that is something we've got to... This is the spiritual power. This is effect. Corinthian, no effect. Why? What was inside them? Sin was inside them. Carnality was inside them. The lack of... Love was inside them. So bad that Paul actually had to write 1 Corinthians 13 to tell them what love is. They don't even know what it is. Spell it out for you. Love is. Wow, the whole thing. And you know, people use it for weddings today. But it was not written for a wedding. It was written for a church. What is love? Right? Do you see the thing over here? So it is not, oh, you're angry, oh, I'm so upset, I've got to hit back. I, stop. You're going to add to the problem. You're going to be just like them. No. Choose a better approach. You know what? I thank God. Sure, the world, the problems, and you're going to see all kinds of evil and wickedness. You're like, yes, Paul is not being naive. Can he still be? happy? Can he still be thankful? Yes. It does not take away. How come? See, the presence of God is greater than the presence of wickedness. The presence of God was just, he was just so conscious of God's presence. And this is something we need to learn to have. We are going to take time to learn and study the theme, the topic, the doctrine of the presence of God. God is there. It's a question of whether we know how to appreciate Him, whether we know how to be conscious of Him, rather to be conscious of all the things that are around us. That's the challenge. See, as long as we allow these things to come on and build up, the blessings of God are just not going to be realized. Wherein is the blessing? Go back to Christ. Go back to God. Go back to your salvation. The grace of God truly saved you. By His grace, He calls us His servant. Remember? He sends. He is going to be there for you. He is going to equip you. He is going to bless you. He is going to enrich you and all that you need to be able to serve. Send. Be His messenger. And He's going to back it up with spiritual power. Look at the effect that it's going to have. The Word of God was going to come alive, take root in those who believe. That's our challenge. That's what we want to attempt to do. Right? That's what we're going to attempt to do. And so, um, you know, next week is Mother's Day. Are we going to uh, celebrate Mother's Day? Of course. But after that, we'll begin a series of meetings. I would like to meet with all the people who are serving. Let's really think and pray, how can we truly perfect service? Seriously. So the first group will be the kitchen service group. Meet with people who are really you know what? I want to be there. I really want to be there. Because 
there's a sense of purpose, there's a sense of being sent, you know, you are effective. See, even in serving like this, yes. You're going to meet with the ushers plus the traffic marshal people. You're going to meet with all who wash. Let's sit down, let's talk. Let's think through this. Let's have a right heart, spirit, understanding. Now, if people don't... We're not looking for volunteers who say, okay, whenever I am free, I'll be there. We're looking for people who say, you know what? I want to develop this ministry. That serving the Lord will be a wonderful trademark over here in Bethel. This is how we serve. With love, with wisdom, with understanding, with all these things in mind. You ask, what is the Bethel chain all about? This is its beginning. It's this heart and spirit and mind, right? Of course, then people will travel, other commitments. Of course, go ahead. But there will always be others. When we come up, this is how we, this is how we got to serve. It's not division. It's not contention. It's not going into all these things and ours is God, His presence, the Lord Jesus Christ sent. You know what? We're going to do this. We're going to serve the Lord. How will it be effective? God will confirm it. When it's done right, watch. See, this is Paul. His belief and his trust is not in how he Effective, he's going to say these things. It's the power of God to salvation. As much as it is in me. So the question is, what is inside us? What is our spirit? Is there truly a spirit of the servant of the Lord? You know, we do this because this is what the Lord means to me. If we do it grudgingly, if we do it, hey, there's nobody else. Oh, I am just, you know, it's almost like a summon. You have been summoned. Oh, why did they choose me? Why didn't you choose the other person? <laughs> then we don't understand these things over here. You might want to reevaluate what it is. Right? I like Isaiah's response. God says, Whom shall I send? Isaiah stepped up, send me. And God is going to use this servant. He's going to correct. He's going to equip. But that's the only response. Send me. There must be a response. God is not going to send an unresponsive person, dead like anything, sleepy like anything, ignorant like anything, can't. He won't do that for obvious reason, because every servant of God represents Him. Well, let's represent the Lord well. Does that make sense to, uh, to us as we read Corinthians? Because we need to, to bring it back, and how do we apply these things into us, ourselves today? Are the problems there? Yes, in every church. Unfortunately, it will be there. That's a question of how we are going to... Look, let's, get, let's focus on the Lord. Let's be conscious of the Lord. Let's go back to the Lord. Let's fill what is inside us. Let there be love. Let there be the Word of God inside us as much as it is inside me. Fill it until it overflows. Then you are like rivers of living water. You f overflow with good stuff. That's what my son say. Because I use that language. I say, son, let me show you the good stuff. And then here's a snack. So he picked up. So every time mommy is cooking something and he gets something, he will run upstairs to my office and say, dad, there's some good stuff. He is not going to just secretly eat it himself. He wants to share it. Good stuff. Whether it's chips, nuggets, or usually all the unhealthy stuff are the good stuff. All the healthy stuff are not good stuff. 
I know that's interesting because you know you just want to share it with people. You have found good stuff. I mean, that's the language of a kid. As much as it is in me, I am ready to share the gospel, preach the gospel, and then that's how he began one uh, Romans and the whole content all the way to sixteen. Wow, got so many good stuff to share. Yes, how to. You know, how to understand, justified, how to live by our faith, how there's forgiveness, go beyond forgiveness, how to battle sin, how to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, how to be overcome, an overcomer, and more. Good stuff. So many are shackled by sin. They don't know how to break free from the power of sin. This is Paul. I want to share with you good stuff. That's what he writes. You know why I want to come? Because I want to impart some gift to you. Knowledge. Good stuff. That's my language, okay? Good stuff. What is inside me, I want to share this with you. That you can be blessed by the Lord. That you may really find a wonderful sense of joy in your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not defeated. Even by suffering, by affliction that comes. This is Romans 8. That is wonderful. Isn't it? Right? Well, think about this. This is something we want to look forward to. Well, let, let this be inside us. As much as it is in me, I am ready. How do you know you're ready? It will come out. The, first, the joy will come out. The love will flow out. We're not talking, if you quote Bible and you're trying to run it down somebody's throat and you're shouting in somebody, you're, you're not ready. You've got to hold yourself back. You've got to calm down. You're, you're not. It is never, the word is Bible bash anyone. There's no bashing involved. It, it just flows from you. With joy, with thanksgiving, with, you no, know, let's look at, truly look at each other with we're not enemies. Brethren. Thank God. You know, can I explain it? You know, you say these things. See, I, I'm just amazed. Here are people accusing him and he absorbs it and he just wants to point them back to Christ. Wow, I like, I like that. I want to do the same. Right? So if you attack me, speak behind my back. I want to pray for you. <laughs> I want to point you back to Christ. It will point you back to the love of Christ, and you know what? That would be wonderful. Hate comes in, love comes out. That would be nice. Too much hate in this world. Too much wickedness. You know what? Comes, take a deep breath, hmm, as much as it is inside me. Let the fragrance of Christ come out. That would be wonderful. Okay? Not smelly, B.O. The fragrance of Christ. All right? Well, let's pray together. Our Father, we just thank you for your word that cleanses, that corrects our understanding, that encourages and lifts up our heart back to you. Truly, your word is far wiser than our own understanding. Lord, guide us with these principles that we will not lose sight of your presence, even if we have to deal with ugly problems like this. That we will be conscious that even the Lord Jesus Christ took accusations and people attacked Him and He still prayed forgiveness to be given. Help us to learn from the wonderful heart of love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this too also be inside us that we will truly be ambassadors of Christ sent to bear the message of the gospel. We ask that you would bless us as we prepare our heart and our mind for worship, for communion later too. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.